Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. It's time for another episode of Rock and Read. Let's see what awesome facts are waiting for us as we read Chapter 5 of the Great Book of Rock Trivia. Sorry my voice sounds scratchy. It's from last night's fireworks show. Breathing in all that smoke. I went live during the show. If you want to watch a replay of our fireworks show, just check out my Instagram, at looking at Logan. Anyway, let's get to Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is called Unforgettable Concerts. Here we go. Events like Woodstock brought music lovers together and made headlines for good and bad reasons. Learn some facts about some of the most notable concerts in rock history. Moondog, Coronation, Ball. The first rock concert took place on March 21st, 1952, but it was a short one. Alan Freed, the radio host who coined the phrase rock and roll to describe the new musical forms, decided to organize a live dance event in the Cleveland area, which had a capacity of a little over 10,000 people. Due to circumstances probably involving a printing error and counterfeiting of tickets, around 20,000 people showed up and tried to crowd in. The fire marshal and the police department had to shut down the concert after less than an hour and disperse the crowd. The next evening, during his show, Freed issued a public apology and invited listeners to call in and tell the operator whether or not they were with the Moondog show. The support poured in. Freed later organized other concerts, including the Moondog Maytime Ball. The program of the Moondog Coronation Ball had featured a number of black musicians who were popular with black and white listeners of Alan Freed's radio show, The Dominoes, who were just starting their careers and would be big throughout the 50s. Tiny Grimes, an R&B and jazz guitarist, Paul Williams and the Hucklebuckers, pioneer of the honking tenure saxophone solo, and singer Veretta Dillard. The Ed Sullivan Show from 1948 to 1971, entertainment columnist Ed Sullivan hosted a variety show, originally called Toast of the Town, on CBS. Most people remember the show as the beginning of Beatlemania, but Sullivan hosted many other up-and-coming rock stars as well. The show appears on TV Guide Magazine's list of the 60 best series of all time, coming in at number 31 in 2013. Let's start with the episode that started the British Invasion, the Beatles' first performances on the show in February of 1964. The Beatles agreed on three performances in return for payment of their travel expenses. An estimated 38% of the U.S. population watched the show on television. Other statistics show that 60% of U.S. televisions that were turned on at that time were tuned to CBS, Ed Sullivan, and the Beatles. The studio had a capacity of 703, but more than 50,000 people begged for tickets for the February 9th show. Richard Nixon's teenage daughter, Julie, was in the audience, but many other celebrities, such as Leonard Bernstein, were unable to get seats for their kids. The Beatles were known for their cheeky humor. They were mobbed by journalists when they arrived at the Kennedy Airport. When asked how he found America, Ringo answered, Turn left to Greenland. The frenzy didn't stop when they got to the hotel, as some teens pretended to be hotel guests in an attempt to meet the band. Fans knew exactly where the Beatles would be at any given time, because Capitol Records had broadcast their itinerary on the radio. Oops. The Beatles were the first performers at their February 9th debut, but they weren't the only acts. The Monkees weren't there, but Davy Jones was. The cast of Broadway's Oliver, in which Jones played the Artful Dodger, performed songs from the play that night. He was nominated for a Tony Award for his performance in Oliver, and went on to have a successful career. Not all of the other acts fared so well. Charlie Brill and Mitzi McCall, married comedy duo and future godparents to Melissa Gilbert, encountered a highly distracted audience and became distracted themselves, forgetting some of their lines and giving a subpar performance. They later said it ruined their career. Sullivan had tried to keep the fans' enthusiasm for the Beatles under control, threatening to send for a barber if they didn't behave. Another guest was the Riddler from the Batman TV series starring Adam West. Aside from his Riddler persona, Frank Goshen was a popular impressionist 
who made audiences laugh by impersonating other stars such as Marlon Brando. Before the Beatles' performance, Sullivan read a telegram of congratulations from Elvis to the Beatles, but Elvis didn't write it. His manager did, in hopes of making Elvis look good. The Beatles performed five songs over their two acts that evening. She Loves You, All My Loving, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Till There Was You, and I Saw Her Standing There. When the camera focused on John, the caption read, Sorry girls, he's married. George Harrison almost missed it. He had come down with tonsillitis and had to skip the rehearsals, but was determined to get through the actual performance, though he had a fever of 102. Some attendees claimed that the studio had a strong smell of urine. Evidently, the excitement was too much for the bladders of some adoring fans. Other attendees claimed that this was a mean-spirited urban myth spread by jealous males. Allegedly, John was intrigued by the vending machines in the studio and asked the stage producer for a change so he could try them out. The Beatles' second appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show on February 16th didn't take place in the Ed Sullivan Theater, but at the Duval Hotel in Miami Beach. The Beatles' appearance may be the most famous, but the Dave Clark Five had more performances than they did, and they appeared on the show 18 times, more than any other British group. Nine years before the Beatles' appearance, Bill Haley and his Comets performed Rock Around the Clock on The Ed Sullivan Show. The CBS network, music historian Jim Dawson, and others consider this to be the first rock performance on national TV. In 1956, a reluctant Ed Sullivan invited Elvis to perform. He had initially objected to having the singer on his family show because of his provocative hip gyrations, but he had to give in after several competitors featured Elvis on their shows, probably resulting in higher ratings. Elvis appeared three times. His first two shows were uncensored, but on his third appearance, he was only filmed from the waist up. The Supremes were a particular favorite of Sullivan's, and they appeared on the show 14 times, or 15, depending on how you count them. The Ed Sullivan show invited a number of black artists through the 50s, against the initial wishes of some sponsors, and Sullivan claimed that we put on everything but bigotry, whether or not his actions always reflected those words. Finally, various Muppets have performed on the show 25 times. The Ed Sullivan Theater today is probably best known as the home of the late show with Stephen Colbert. Newport Folk Festival Newport, Rhode Island is home to the Newport Folk Festival, founded in 1959. Several notable folk-slash-rock musicians have performed there, such as Bob Dylan, Pete Singer, and Joan Baez. It is one of North America's first modern music festivals. Joan Baez made her debut the first year. The second year, the festival was expanded and included folk musicians from all over the world. This was where the song We Shall Overcome became a staple of the civil rights movement. It was based on an older Baptist hymn, I'll Overcome Someday. Theo Bickle and the Freedom Singers Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, and Pete Seeger performed the new version as the last act on the Friday of the 1962 festival. Participants also integrated a bus in the 60s when a group of white performers stopped to pick up a group of black performers. The bus was already full, so the white male performers stood up to allow the black female performers to sit. At the 1965 festival, Bob Dylan caused controversy for using an electric guitar. There are two accounts for the source of the audience's discontent. One story, supported by Pete Seeger, is that audience members were booing simply because the sound system was bad and they couldn't hear Dylan properly. The other story is that some folk purists felt that Dylan was selling out by using an electric guitar instead of an acoustic one, therefore merging rock and folk. He also had a nine-piece band backing him. However, he wasn't the first folk musician to play an electric guitar at the festival. The Butterfield Blues Band, the Chambers Brothers, and the Howlin' Wolf had performed there with electric guitars that year, and Muddy Waters had always used one. The Beatles at Shea Stadium The first stadium rock concert took place on August 15, 1965, when the Beatles performed for a crowd of 55,600 mostly teenage fans at Shea Stadium, home of the New York Mets baseball team. It was the start of the band's second U.S. tour. Tickets cost $5.65, including tax, and the concert brought in $304,000. The band got $160,000. New York City authorities nixed the Beatles' idea of landing on the diamond by helicopter, 
so they arrived in a Wells Fargo armored van. They did, however, get a tour of the city by helicopter before the show. The tour and show were filmed by Sullivan Productions. The stage was far from the audience, on second base, and only police and security were allowed on the infield. There were 2,000 security personnel for the concert. A few fans fainted and had to be carried out. The distance from the audience did save the band from being pelted with jelly beans, though. Vendors sold cheap binoculars and Beatles wigs. Fans held banners and wore sandwich boards, one of which read, Paul, don't marry Jane. Actress Jane Asher broke up with him in 1968. Shea Stadium was closed in 2008. To bring things full circle, Paul McCartney, along with Billy Joel, played the last concert there, Fantasy Fair and Magic Mountain Music Festival. This was the first event of the famed Summer of Love and prototype of modern outdoor rock festivals. It was scheduled for June 3rd and 4th of 1967, but bad weather forced the organizers to postpone it one week. It took place on Mount Amalpas in Marin County, California at the Sydney B. Cushing Memorial Amphitheater. Since the festival was organized by the KFRC radio station, it is often referred to as the KFRC Festival. The mountain is in the San Francisco area, which was the center of the hippie counterculture at the time. While rock started out as the music of teenagers, with the Beatles, Elvis, and other acts, it is now firmly a part of the adult scene, with psychedelic rock on the rise. Audience members traveled up the mountain by school bus. Tickets cost $2, and organizers donated the proceeds to Hunters Point Child Care Center in San Francisco. It was a multi-act outdoor festival that included a number of rising musicians. The Doors, Canned Heat, Dionne Warwick, Jefferson Airplane, The Birds with South African trumpeter Hugh Maskella, The Seeds, The Grassroots, Country Joe, and The Fish, among many others for a total of over 30 Acts. A co-producer claimed that the Grateful Dead's chemist distributed acid into the crowd. The organizers took the precaution of bringing a doctor to handle people who had bad trips, which included some performers such as Don Van Villet of Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band. There were tire swings for guests to use, as well as a toboggan slope of wet straw to slide down on a piece of cardboard. The birds didn't have a drummer with them. A member of the stage crew offered to drum for them, but there were no spare drumsticks available, so he cut off the legs of a coffee table and used them. Since there was no backstage area, the musicians mixed freely with the crowd. It was the first large show for the Doors. Jim Morrison made a great impression on the crowd as a musician while singing Light My Fire, but not as a person, as he was drunk. Evidently, people who were high looked down on people who were drunk and fell off the stage during the performance. Newspaper accounts say the participants behaved well and left the premises clean. Monterey International Pop Music Festival The Monterey Pop Festival was more publicized than the KFRC Festival of the previous week, and it took place at the Monterey County Fairgrounds in California from June 16th to June 18th, 1967. It was a much larger festival, with the crowd size fluctuating between 25,000 and 90,000 people. The ticket price for the full weekend was $6.50, but attendees could also purchase tickets for one day. Most of the musicians performed for free and only accepted payment for travel and accommodation. Ravi Shankar got $3,000 for his sitar performance. Shankar performed for an afternoon, but other artists got 40 minutes, with some performing for 25. Though Jimi Hendrix was well known in the United Kingdom, most people in the U.S. still had not heard of him. That changed in Monterey. His proficiency on the guitar was unparalleled. He even played it behind his back and plucked the strings with his teeth. After playing Wild Thing, Hendrix lit his guitar on fire before smashing it and throwing the pieces into the audience. Hendrix knew he had to one-up the Who. They had played before him and were known in the UK for smashing their instruments. Other notable performances included Otis Redding, who hadn't played for many large white audiences before, and Janis Joplin's rendition of Ball and Chain with Big Brother and the Holding Company. Some musicians were unable to come because they couldn't get a visa. The Kinks, Donovan, and the Rolling Stones. The Beach Boys also canceled. Flowers were everywhere, even on police officers. About 100,000 blossoms were brought from Hawaii and given to guests. Hippie culture was relatively unknown outside California until Monterey, when footage of the festival was broadcast on national TV. 
the quintessential hippie song, San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, was composed specifically for the occasion by John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas to be sung by Scott McKenzie at the close of the festival, the Beatles' rooftop concert. The Beatles' final public performance was a surprise. On the roof of their multimedia corporation on January 30, 1969, the band treated an office and fashion district in central London to an impromptu performance, playing for 42 minutes before police asked them to keep quiet. Parts of the performance can be seen in the documentary, Let It Be. The Beatles couldn't be seen well from the street, but a crowd of people, mostly on their lunch break, formed to listen. Office workers leaned out their windows to enjoy the performance, and workers in neighboring buildings watched them from their roofs. Traffic stopped. The performance also involved women's clothing. John and Ringo must have forgotten it was winter, and they didn't have their jackets. Ringo wore his wife's candy apple red raincoat, and John wore Yoko Ono's fur coat. Since the wind was causing mic noise, an engineer covered the microphones with pantyhose. Aside from the Beatles' own songs, they sang parts of Danny Boy and God Save the Queen. After closing the set with made-up lyrics to the tune of Get Back, the police were up there. John ended by saying, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the group and ourselves, and I hope we pass the audition. The Beatles were not the first to hold a rooftop concert, however. Jefferson Airplane had done so the month before in New York, and were stopped by police after one song. While the police did stop the Beatles' performance, they waited quite a while to do so. The police department was meters away from the Beatles' Apple headquarters. They only came after a few business people started complaining. As this performance took place at a time when the Beatles were fighting amongst themselves, they would break up soon after. They hired a Sessions keyboardist, American musician Billy Preston, as a buffer. It worked. The building that once housed Apple Corps, not to be confused with the computer company, and was the home of the rooftop concert, is now in Abercrombie and Fitch, Woodstock. Everyone's heard of the Woodstock Music and Art Fair. Did you know it didn't take place in Woodstock? The original plan was to have the event near that town, but they ended up changing the location several times due to lack of suitable venues and permits. Dairy farmer Max Jaeger allowed the organizers to use the fields where he grew alfalfa for hay, not his actual dairy farm. August 1969 was two years after the Monterey Pop Festival, and the performers from that festival were now big stars. Rainy weather caused timetable disruptions, so that many bands ended up performing hours after their scheduled times. Jimi Hendrix started his famous performance, which included his psychedelic rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, arguably the greatest Star Spangled Banner performance in history, in my opinion. At 8.30 Monday morning, when the 400,000-person crowd had dwindled to 30,000, actually, traffic threw the schedule off even before the rain came. Richie Havens was scheduled to perform in the evening, but the opening acts didn't arrive on time, and he had to take their place. Havens had to fill the time until other bands got there, so he played everything he knew and then started on Freedom. The thing is, that wasn't a song yet. He improvised it on the spot and had to watch the video later to remember what he'd sung. Havens died in 2013, and his ashes were scattered at the Woodstock Festival site. It wasn't intended as a free concert. Tickets were sold for $18 or $24, which was a lot of money back then. But when the day came, organizers had to declare it a free concert since there had been no time to build a fence or ticket booths. With just a few days to plan, after finally finding a venue, it was either the fence or the stage. And organizers wisely chose the stage. Ravi Shankar didn't particularly enjoy his time at the festival, calling it terrifying, and saying that the people in the mud reminded him of water buffaloes. Some bands missed the event. Iron Butterfly was stranded at the airport, and may have received an off-color telegram in response to their request for a helicopter. Joni Mitchell was scheduled to appear on the Dick Cavett show, and her manager talked her into keeping that appointment. John Lennon claimed his visa request was refused. The Doors, Tommy James, and the Shondles, and the Birds later regretted their decision not to participate, claiming they didn't know it was going to be such a big deal. The frontman of Jethro Tull didn't like the idea of playing for so many high and naked people, and the guitarist of Procol Harum didn't want to miss the birth of his baby. One woman was airlifted when she went into labor, and she gave birth in a nearby hospital, and another woman gave birth in a car. 
Many people say they were conceived at Woodstock. Due to insufficient preparation, vendors ran out of food quickly, leaving thousands of hungry hippies. A Bethel woman named Lenny Binder made hundreds of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for Woodstock attendees. The local Jewish community also made hundreds of sandwiches with cold cuts and pickles. Who distributed these sandwiches? Nuns. The U.S. military also airlifted food into the venue and provided up to 45 volunteer medics, despite the anti-war protests and songs. Even with the crowds, the lack of food and facilities, and the mud, there was only one reported act of physical violence, and that took place on stage. Pete Townsend conked Avist Abby Hoffman on the head with his guitar when the latter interrupted the Who's concert. The activists left the scene, and the show went on. Also, a concession stand was burnt down after raising its prices, a move deemed by attendees to be against the spirit of the festival. Even with the relatively good behavior, the organizers were plagued by 80 lawsuits, mostly from surrounding farms who hadn't expected the crowd. Since Woodstock cost much more than it brought in, they had to wait for the Woodstock film revenue to pay off their debts. Isle of Wight Festival Often called the British Woodstock, the Isle of Wight Festival took place in England from 1968 to 1970, and it was restarted in 2002. Isle of Wight Act prohibits gatherings of over 5,000 people on the small island without a permit. This was a result of the 1970 festival, which brought in over 600,000 people. Some accounts say 700,000. The 1969 festival marked the first performance Bob Dylan gave after a serious motorcycle accident he had had three years before. In fact, he missed Woodstock because he was preparing to leave for this festival which he especially wanted to attend because the island had been the home of Alfred Lord Tennyson. He also told promoters that he would only come if Richie Havens was also invited. He was. Jimi Hendrix had his second-to-last performance at the festival in 1970. His last concert was at the Open Air Love and Peace Festival in Vermaarn, Germany, and he died three weeks later. Having performed the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock, he did God Save the Queen at the English Festival. Harlem Cultural Festival. This was a series of six concerts held on Sundays throughout the summer of 1969, and is often called Black Woodstock. The Black Panthers provided security, as police refused to do so. There were no incidents, even though 100,000 people attended the concerts. Nina Simone sang her rendition of the Beatles' Revolution, with quite a few lyrics and stylistic changes. Simone later left the U.S., feeling the black people would never get their due. The concerts were recorded, but no TV stations were interested in buying the videos. Aside from Nina Simone's performance and a few other clips, the footage has not been shown. The fact that such an important event has not been picked up by TV probably proves Simone's sentiments right. Sly and the Family Stone performed at Woodstock and the Harlem Cultural Festival. Other performers included B.B. King, the Staple Singers, Mahila Jackson, Gladys Knight, Hugh Miskella, and Stevie Wonder. Altamont Free Concert The Altamont Speedway Free Festival is often called the anti-Woodstock, the end of the 60s, and the second day the music died. Accounts differ on exactly what happened there, but the fact is that a teenager ended up dead in the hands of a Hell's Angel. In addition, there were three other accidental deaths and several acts of violence toward performers and other attendees, some involving Hell's Angels. Previous events such as Woodstock, the Harlem Cultural Festival, and the Monterey Pop Festival had told the world that young people could achieve peace if given the freedom to do so, and Altamont seemed to end that idea. Like Woodstock, the venue was changed, and the organizers, members of Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead, were offered Altamont Speedway just 20 hours before the concert. Grace Slick stated that the vibes were bad. She didn't feel good about the location, but felt she had to accept it. The tour photographer, Ethan Russell, also reported a bad feeling about the area. Later, astrologists would claim that it had been an inauspicious day for a concert. After the Hells Angels knocked out a member of Jefferson Airplane, Marty Ballin, the Grateful Dead refused to perform and left the premises. The violence only stopped during the performance by country-slash-rock band the Flying Burrito Brothers. What a name. At least one woman gave birth at the festival. Some accounts say four. There were 300,000 people in attendance with no water and bathrooms. Local police and residents had not been informed of the concert.
The stage was low and therefore easy for people to climb onto who weren't supposed to be there. The Hell's Angels, who were there to provide security through intimidation, had taken their payment in beer and were drunk. It was a recipe for disaster and a blueprint for how not to plan a concert. Strawberry Fields Festival Like other festivals, the venue was changed several times. It ended up at the Mossport Raceway in Bowmanville, Ontario. In Canada, this 1970 event was advertised as a motorcycle race with contemporary entertainment and an attempt to avoid public outcry against a rock concert. Since it was openly advertised as a rock concert in the U.S., locals soon found out what it really was, but the Supreme Court allowed it to proceed. To avoid making wires out of the organizers, a few motorcyclists took some laps around the track during the event. John Lennon and Yoko Ono were supposed to host the event, but they backed out after the first change of venue. Attendees did not report many notable performances for the festival, but they had fun lounging in the sun and skinny dipping in the lake. The one exceptional performance was when Sly and the Family Stone closed the event by playing I Want to Take You Higher as the Sun Rose. Since Love, Sun, and Sound had been so heavily promoted across the border, thousands of Americans hit the road and headed for Canada. Several were turned back because they couldn't prove they had sufficient funds, about $40, to support themselves there. One fan drowned in an attempt to swim the St. Lawrence River. Others were arrested for carrying illegal drugs. Glatzenberry Festival This annual festival in Somerset, England, had seen some great performances. As of 2015, the festival has welcomed over 2.8 million people. The first festival took place in 1970. Glatzenberry started off small. In 1970, 1,500 people attended. It was the day after Jimi Hendrix died. In 1971, the mystical-minded producer, Andrew Kerr, scheduled the festival over the solstice. He also used sacred geometry to choose the Glatzenberry site and had the pyramid-shaped stage built as a sacred structure. There wasn't supposed to be a festival in 1978, but 500 people turned up on their way from Stonehenge, thinking that there was one. They set up an impromptu festival powered by a generator, and some bands who happened to be nearby came to play. There were no huge names, Sphinx and a space rock band called Hawkwind. It became an annual event in 1981 with a few short breaks. Because it often rains at that time, mud sports such as mud surfing became popular. In 1984, attendees got into the Guinness Book of World Records for feet that had nothing to do with music. 826 people juggled 2,478 objects in total. Organizers in 2007 were well prepared, with 2,485 miles of toilet paper on hand. Live Aid By 1985, organizers of benefit concerts had learned a lot, and the management was much more efficient than George Harrison and Ravi Shankar's concert for Bangladesh. Live Aid was a global concert opened by Prince Charles and Princess Diana in London at Wembley Stadium. Over a billion viewers watched the 16 hours of music on TV or attended in London or Philadelphia. There were shows in Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union, and Australia, but they were not broadcast. The goal was to raise money for Africans who were suffering under famine, and the concert brought in over $125 million. The singles Do They Know It's Christmas and We Are the World came before Live Aid and raised over $54 million. Phone lines were set up to take donations. The organizer, Bloomtown Rath singer Bob Geldof, was knighted for his work. However, this didn't help him find a taxi after the program and he had to hitchhike to get home. As for the musicians, there was one who played both concerts. Thanks to Concord, Phil Collins performed in London and then in Philadelphia. The concert was so big that all the rehearsal spaces in Philadelphia were booked and the pretenders had to rehearse in a bar. Eric Clapton got a shock from his microphone while performing White Room. Geldof felt that the best performance of the event was Queen's and he wasn't alone. The band went all out for Live Aid, seamlessly performing a melody of six hit songs. Since this was a tightly organized concert, all performances had to stick to a 20 minute time limit and a red light warned them that their time was up. Pete Townsend, being Pete Townsend, broke the light, and The Who played five more minutes. U2 thought they had given a poor performance, but it brought them into the mainstream. And Mick Jagger couldn't keep his or his singing partner's clothes on, first pulling off his own t-shirt and then ripping Tina Turner's dress, revealing a leotard. Perhaps they set a precedent for Super Bowl 2004. 
Live Aid wasn't free from controversy. Stevie Wonder noted that there were a few black performers. Geldof then added more. Also, unbeknownst to most viewers, and probably the organizers and performers too, the biggest problem in Ethiopia was not famine, but civil war, and some of the money may have ended up financing the dictator. Finally, Lollapalooza. Lollapalooza, an annual music festival featuring heavy metal, alternative rock, punk, and hip-hop, among other genres, was originally organized by Jane's Addiction singer Perry Farrell. From 1991 through 1997, and in 2003, Wallapalooza was a traveling festival, but poor ticket sales in 2004 ended this, as well as canceling the festival for that year. It now takes place in Chicago, and there were a few international branches. The word Wallapalooza means an extraordinary or unusual thing, person, or event, an exceptional example or instance. It was also once a shibboleth used by American soldiers during World War II, as Japanese spies would not have been able to pronounce it correctly. Farrell heard it in a Three Stooges film and liked the way it sounded. The event indirectly spawned another festival. Ozzy Osbourne was initially rejected by Lollapalooza organizers for some reason. Perhaps they didn't want any burning crosses or bad incidents. Ozzy's wife Sharon gave Ozzy his own festival, OzFest. This led to the reunion of Black Sabbath. Mosh pits and crowd surfing became popular in Lollapalooza. The festival also featured open mic tents, tattoo artists, and piercing parlors. After the show settled in Chicago, Kidapalooza opened its own area next door showing family-friendly performances. In 1993, the four members of Rage Against the Machine took the stage wearing nothing but a strip of tape over their mouths, with the letters PMRC painted on their chest. This was a protest against the Parents Music Resource Center, a censorship project fronted by Tipper Gore. The audience at first cheered them on, but then started throwing plastic water bottles when it became apparent the band wasn't going to perform at all. Attendees at the 1995 festival decided to have fun with a mud fight. Unfortunately, it wasn't much fun for Pavement, the band that was performing at the time. When someone threw a handful of mud at guitarist Stephen Malkmus, singer Scott Cannonberg, flipped the bird, and mooned the crowd before the band left the stage. Well, we'll end on that cheeky note. That's the end of Chapter 5. Let me know what you guys thought of Chapter 5 in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Until then, rock on.